We're coming to our sermon passage this morning in the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. Again, that's Daniel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 21. Hear God's Word. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names, Daniel, he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs, And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. And so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Our Lord God, we do thank you for your word, and we pray now that you would speak to us and help us to understand what it is that you have to say, and indeed by your spirit to be transformed by it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Parents play uh, games with their children, and they sing songs uh, with their children. And one uh, game and song that parents quite often play with their children goes like this. Imagine the child's name is Jimmy. The parent will say, how big are you, Jimmy? And then will say, so big, and the little little boy, the little Jimmy, will raise his hands and giggle. 
How big are you, Jimmy? So big. How big is your God? So big? So big. Daniel was so brave because his God was so big. The text emphasizes this in uh, a repeated refrain, verse 2. Always helpful to have the Bible open in front of you if you can have the Bible. Verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Verse 9. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So again, verse 2, the Lord gave, verse 9, and God gave, verse 17, God gave. So there they are, in exile in Babylon. They've been taken into exile by King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel, along with his friends, has been taken into the court of the king to learn the special pagan educational philosophy of Babylon. But according to the Bible, God gave. God gave. God gave. And this is the secret to Daniel's bravery. Daniel took a stand. He said, thus far and no further. He drew a line in the sand. Uh, the issue wasn't the food as such. It's not that Daniel was making a commitment to vegetarianism. Daniel was saying, thus far, no further. He drew a line in the sand because he knew that God was with him. He knew that God was in charge. He knew that God gave even that situation, even exile. God was in charge. Daniel was so brave because Daniel had such a big God. When we think of the almighty power of God, we tend to think of the stupendous scale of the universe. And yet there is a greater comparison still. In the midst of the evil of this world, in the midst of the challenges of your life, God is still sovereign. He's still in charge. And so even at the cross of Jesus Christ, even at the crucifixion of the Son of God, God gave, God gave, God gave. And therefore, on this State of the Vision uh, Sunday, same Sunday as our annual meeting tonight, I always preach a State of the Vision sermon, I'm calling you to be like Daniel. I'm calling you to live a life of courage and commitment. I'm calling you to get off the bench and into the game. I'm calling you to take a stand, make a difference. Uh, 
some of you know I used to play rugby, and in uh, rugby games, before the match, there's always what's called a psych up. Kind of like a rallying cry to get out on the game. And some of those locker room talks were quite vigorous, shall we say. I remember one particular person I used to play with called Charlie Ward in the middle of those locker room talks would literally bang his head against the wall to get himself ready for the game. I'm not asking you to do that. But I am asking you to get into the game. You say, that sounds scary. When I was on the mission field, we traveled between one country and another of the former Soviet Union on a train that was very dilapidated and in really poor condition. And we traveled through the night, our mission team, me and two other women on the mission team, in the third class of this carriage, um, surrounded by other people, packed in with broken windows, darkness, very little light. We'd been given a rather expensive suitcase to transport from one country to another to give to a missionary. It had in it various supplies and I think money for this missionary. You couldn't just wire money to this country. You had to physically bring it in. And in the middle of that long train journey, packed in with other people, with this very expensive looking suitcase that was saying, rob me, rob me, rob me. We sat down opposite a man who I think was certainly a mafia guy. I've told this story to my children. They know it as the knife story. The mafia guy in the middle of the night, once these two fellow team members of mine at the time had fallen asleep, about one in the morning, he got out a long knife and he had the hairiest back of his hands I'd ever seen in my life. And he started to shave the back of his hands with his knife, the hair. And he kept on saying to me over and over again, you're tired, go to sleep. God protected me. How big is your God? Big enough to go on the mission field? Big enough to give to the mission of the church and trust Him with your provisions? Big enough to tell someone about Jesus and take the risk of rejection? Sometimes people ask me, why are you in America? You sound like you're from a foreign country. What brought you here? And the, the answer is that God brought me here. And when we first flew out, we flew out with a laptop, a printer, three suitcases, nowhere to stay, to a church of 20 to 30 people, really 20 to 30 people, because one of the family members had 10 children, so it was really 20 to 30. And we flew out to a church with a long history of conflict. One of the local pastors said to me when I arrived, when I heard you were coming, I thought, oh no, another pastor for them to chew up and spit out. And we flew out to a church which was, had nowhere to meet. It was meeting in the Seventh-day Adventist building on Saturday night, and we met on Sunday morning, a convenient arrangement. And we flew out to this church with no money, not enough to pay us for any more than a year with all the savings put together. I remember looking at the church growth theory of American churches during those early years, and what I discovered was that for a church to grow, you had to have one parking space per 1.5 Americans. I wasn't sure what 1.5 Americans meant, but 
That was the statistic. And I looked out of our window one day at that church and realized that we had no parking spaces. None. We had no advertising, no marketing budget. And yet God grew us. Just had a um, Facebook message from a young guy that we baptized there who's now a leading Christian down in Florida, <laughs> baptized in the baptismal pool of the Seventh-day Adventist church. How big is your God? Big enough to deal with Nebuchadnezzar? Big enough for you to actually take a stand and get off the bench and into the game and say, thus far, no further, I'm not doing that sin anymore. I'm doing away with it. I'm taking a stand for Jesus. How, how big is your God? I'm doing a Bible study right now with some men in the congregation. We're going through 2 Timothy each week. It's a Zoom Bible study, and we, we've got to the part, point where Paul says to Timothy, his young protege, don't argue about words. What was going on in Ephesus at the time is there's various different kinds of false teaching, and the temptation when you are faced with a Nebuchadnezzar pagan philosophy is to spend all your time attacking and going on Twitter and engaged in a war of words. Don't do that, Paul says to Timothy. Instead, teach, train, evangelize. Don't curse the darkness, light a candle. How big is your God? Big enough so that the gospel can actually lead to the change that you long to see in your neighborhood, in your families? Daniel didn't start criticizing the pagan philosophy of his day. He didn't attack Nebuchadnezzar. He took a stand this far no further. And God gave. That God gave him fame and success and influence. How big is your God? You say, what does that mean for us as a church, this state of the vision? Well, we had a 2020 vision that, of course, finished at the end of 2020. I remember around this time last year, perhaps a month or so earlier, perhaps it was March this time last year, sitting down with the team and beginning to map out how we could complete 2020 vision, how we could check off the last bits we needed to do by the end of 2020. And then, COVID. Our whole world changed. Those meetings moved from being meetings about how to check off the last bits of 2020 vision to how to make sure that we could pay the bills, to make sure that we, do we meet, do we not meet? And if we're going to meet, how do we meet? And if we're going to do Zoom and video, and how, how are we going to do that? And we had the last year, be kind to your pastors. The last year has been the most challenging time for churches across the world in the last 100 years. Without any question, because church is about gathering. And that's the one thing that's been hard to do. Be kind to your pastors. They have soaked up the pressure that you have felt. They have been peacemakers between any number of conflicts around COVID. Our pastors, our elders have done an extraordinary job. Uh, Mark Taylor chaired the elders uh, this year for the third year in a row in the midst of a global pandemic. 
And yet, how big is our God? This is what God did. We had a capital campaign. in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> wow. We're doing a church plant, our first national church plant. It's a whole story behind that of how God prepared the way, how God connected relationships in ways that we could not have predicted or planned. In the middle of a of COVID. Our budget. We ended this year's budget with a percentage better than any in the last eight years. It's amazing. We had our largest ever membership class in February. That's how big our God is. Same time, the church leadership's been through a vision process. Obviously, 2020 vision comes to the end in the end of 2020. We're now in 2021. So, what's next? Where are we? Where we're we going? How are we going to get there? So, our vision process, we used uh, obviously uh, tools, we relied upon scripture primarily, we prayed. We had planning. We had a special planning weekend. We had various subcommittees and teams planning out various things over the last nine months. We've done surveys of the congregation and of the neighborhood, and we've done a deep dive into our data as a church. What does it all show us? Where are we? Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Where we are? Here's how we would summarize where we are as a congregation. We feel we understand the Bible. By and large, we feel like we have a fairly good grasp of the Bible. I'm sure there's always more we can learn, but we feel like we have a fairly good grasp of the Bible. But we're aware we're not so good at actual practical discipleship and evangelism. In theory, we know how to disciple someone. In practice, we're not doing it that often. In theory, we know how to evangelize someone, tell someone about Jesus. In practice, we're not doing it as often as we could be. We also feel anxious. I think that's probably got worse in the last year. And we feel busy pulled in many different demands by family and work, sports. We're actually reaching more people, the data shows. Uh, baptisms are up by about 7%. Visitors are up by about, I think it's 4% or so. Overall members and regular attenders in our data is up by about 2.5% or something like that. We're reaching more people that the... the um, the Zoom thing, the broadcast thing has reached many people this year. We're reaching more people, but we're less frequent in actual attendance. The number of weeks a year we actually go to a small group or go to an adult community or go to church. It seems to be where we are. So, where are we going? Well, that comes down to, of course, vision and mission. And the answer to that is our vision and mission is the same. Hasn't changed. Our vision is the God-centered gospel of Jesus Christ, proclaimed in us as a church and through us to the world by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. So we are a God-centered, gospel-centered, Jesus-proclaiming, global vision, Spirit-empowered kind of church. That's our vision. It's the same. Hasn't changed. And our mission, we summarize simply in three words, 
proclaiming the gospel. It's now on the tower as you come in, proclaiming the gospel. Hasn't changed, but clearly there's a gap. How do we get closer to this vision? How do we fulfill this mission? So we have now, uh, how are we going to get there? Five initiatives, and these will be adjusted and tweaked over the next year or so. These aren't set in stone. Life changes. We don't know the future. Only God knows the future. But these currently are our initiatives. First pathway. So in the surveys and in the conversation, it became clear that we need to do a better job of explaining to our neighbors and those we're trying to reach what it is that College Church offers. We thought about it in terms of the hero of the story. What's the hero of the story we're telling? The hero of the story is not the staff, it's not the pastors, it's not the elders, it's not the deacons. The hero of the story are the people we are called to serve. That means the congregation, it means the mission of the church outside the four walls of the church. So we've come up a very simple pathway to explain what it is that as a church we're offering. Here it is, discover. When someone comes to Cottage Church, they have the opportunity to discover Jesus. Grow, they have the opportunity to grow in your faith. Impact, the opportunity to impact the world, to make a difference. That's why you come to College Church, because you can discover more about Jesus, you get to grow in your faith, you get to have an impact on the world around. Second initiative, hospitality. It became clear as we talked to various people in the congregation and leaders that we need to do a better job of being warm and engaging, of, of uh, shepherding and caring for each other, and the elders and leaders are very much engaged in moving that ball forward over the next year or so, a biblical hospitality. Discipleship, we need to connect the dot between what we know and what we do, and so um, over the next few months and then beginning in the fall of 21, we'll be starting a over the whole church discipleship emphasis to increase our practical as well as intellectual discipleship. Crossings. A part of 2020 vision was uh, purchasing contiguous property strategically as it came up and we've done that and then of course the question is what are we going to use those buildings for? And what we've decided as a leadership is that the crossings building, that's the old Tom's Price building, the west wing of that will be used for basic open gathering space. So not a huge expensive refit, but basic open gathering space for our cottage ministry, our student ministries, our outreach ministries of various kinds. And then the rest of the properties that we have, all cash flow, and so we're going to hold a flexible approach to them. Planting. There's a renewed desire to do church planting. We're doing a church plant this year, and we want by 2030, so that's some way off, to do multiple new church plants over the next uh, few years or so. So what does that, what does that mean for us uh, as, a, uh, as a congregation? What does that mean for us? Well, if we are going to be calling people to discover Jesus, it means each one invite one. If we're going to grow in our faith, it means each one engage as one. We come together and we engage. We're ready to hear. We're ready to learn. We're ready to grow. We're, we're committed. We're excited about it. We're engaged. Each one serve the one, whether that's children's ministry, disability ministries, going on a church plant, going as a missionary, um, your generous giving. Each one serve the one. Discover, grow, impact. And that discover, grow, impact is going to be the shape of our new webpage that's coming in June, roughly speaking. And here's what happens when we do that. These are our 
former pastoral residents, pastors that we've trained up and are sent around the country and the world having an impact. Here's just some of them. Here are some more of them. This is what we, what God has done through us. Here are some of our church plants. That's the most recent one at the top, Pastor Zach. And then you can see there are others there. And there are also global church plants that we're doing too. This is what God is doing through us. Here are our evangelists. Uh, that's Nate uh, ev uh, doing evangelism among college students, but there are also evangelism in Englewood, south, south side of Chicago, uh, prisons, and other evangelists that we are sending out. It's what God is doing through us. And here are our partner seminaries all around the world, training Christian leaders and pastors in all different continents. And here are the over 200 people sent out as missionaries around the globe. That's the impact. How big is your God? A call for courage and commitment. He said, I, I feel a little bit scared about this. I'm not sure I can invite one. Corrie Ten Boom, who was used by God to rescue Jews during the Second World War, subsequent to that had a global ministry going around encouraging people that God can use anyone. And one story she tells about this is of a uh, woodpecker, so, you know, a little bird, the woodpecker, pecking on a tree, and the woodpecker is pecking away and storm comes and there's a lightning bolt and as the woodpecker pecks, the lightning hits the tree and the tree is slammed over. And the woodpecker flies away saying to itself, I never knew there was so much power in my beak. It's not about how big you are, it's about how big God is. Let's pray together. And in the quiet, would you commit? Would you say to the Lord, here am I, use me. Would you ask God to fill you with His Spirit? It's not about your power, it's about His power. It's not about how big you are, it's about how big He is. Oh Lord God, help us to be like Daniel, to take a stand of courage and commitment because you are such a big God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.